All right, let's roll. We're live. Is it time for me to say something yet, Molly? I said we're live. <laughs> okay. Hi, everybody. We still haven't gotten all the coordination down right as far as how to use the introduction. Hi, everybody. Still haven't gotten everything right about how to coordinate that opening, but we're live, I understand. So uh, welcome back to the Astro Imaging. We're, <laughs> we're back. Uh, we're <laughs> time for our blooper reel to start again. Um, welcome back to the Astro Imaging channel. As you can see, in response to uh, the brightness of the sun, I have shown you my, um, I guess my hearth, I guess that's called in my little house here. We turned it around a little bit, but it's still the same old Alex. And um, tonight we're going to get joined by Isa Mohammed. And I'm really happy about this because I think you guys hear me every week saying, hey, come on, we need more presenters. We need you people to step forward. We're doing this show every week and we need content for this show and the only way we can get that content is if you guys step forward now and then i talked specifically to the women that were with us last week we need more women doing this kind of stuff to make us more human you know the whole human race we um we we need volunteers so please go to the astroimagingchannel.org uh hit the contact button and uh come on in okay um as a matter of fact i'm going to show you how to do that right now as soon as I can remember how to present present my entire screen oops and then if I'm not mistaken let's look at uh, this is our website the astroimagingchannel.org in case you haven't caught up with it we've make, made some changes in the last year and you can see that Oh, these the guys that have been working here, uh, Tolga and Molly and um, uh, Eric and Terry have all been doing a great job of getting people lined up. So we've got another six, seven weeks of schedule and that's good. And you can see the topics that we've got coming up, um, how to use different kinds of, of equipment, how to build a remote observatory. Uh, so just some darn good imaging from Giuseppe. Um, we got all sorts of stuff coming up for you and we hope to continue that and we hope that every once in a while somebody will hit the contact button give us your name and say i'd like to do a show about such and so and so and such and tell us what you've got and convince us that you're going to be able to show some people some stuff and hey you're on that's what that's what isa did and isa joined us now isa probably joined us because about oh four months ago back when we were all younger and could visit with people a lot more often. Um, back, back then, where am I? Back then we all, um, we were doing an outreach. The Riverside Astronomical Society does about 60 outreaches a year. And we were at, um, in a school in Corona. Okay, and this was before coronavirus was all, all the thing to do. And so we were in Corona and somebody brought up, you know, there's this virus going around. You sure we should be doing this kind of outreach with people swapping, you know, grabbing onto our eyepieces and all that other stuff. And our idea at the time was, well, you know what, when the authorities say to do something about it, we'll do something about it and we'll figure out a different way to, well, about a week and a half later, mm -hmm, our governor came along and, and New York's governor and a few others said, yeah, you guys got to stop doing this kind of stuff um, where you go out and meet the public and do all, you gather lots of people. And so our outreach program, which does about 60 outreaches a year, is, you know, screeched to a halt and we had to come up with something else. Well, the obvious thing is to do virtual star parties where we take people out and show them what's up. But none of us were equipped to do that. We didn't know how to, we, we knew how to take astro images, honestly, because I've done astro imaging before, but that's not the same thing as inviting somebody to look to see where your telescope's pointed right now. That's a different kind of astro imaging and it's separated. Now there's really no absolute distinction between uh, EAA, electronic assisted astronomy, and 
what we call astroimaging. There's a difference in cloudy nights, but that's only to keep things separated so that the two don't get mixed. EAA is mostly for um, showing people, it's an assisted visual observing. And you can show people what you're actually looking at as the, as, as the image builds right then and there. There's nothing keeping you from taking that image and processing it as much as you want. You can't start talking about it over in cloudy nights anymore because that's just breaking the form rules. But there's nothing wrong with it. It's still astro imaging. And I think, um, you know, we said, if we're going to do this, we better learn how to do it. So I said, oh, I know we should find somebody on the astro imaging channel to tell us about it. That's where Issa got the idea because I, I said that a long time ago. I should also tell you that we had our first actual program. We had had two or three practices, but then Thursday night, the University of California at Riverside, their outreach program with Zinandu, and our outreach guy, John Lee Bagbagia, got together to produce a outreach program. I was part of it. And we had about 582 people watching during the show. And last I checked, we had 2,700 hits on it. And they were watching for a substantial amount of time. So this is an important thing to do. There are people who have been doing this. Isa is one of them. And I'm about to turn it over to Isa. Isa, tell us about your program, how you do it, and what, what we need to know to do electronic assisted astronomy. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Alex. Um, do, I, do I turn on the present... No. You, Whenever you're ready. Whenever or you, ready. you can show us your face for a while and just talk like I just did, or you can go right into a PowerPoint or whatever you're doing. Uh, you, it's sharing your screen. Well, well, okay. Let me let me let me save everyone having to look at my face and let's 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 start with. Um, I'll still have a mini screen of your face on top of your presentation. <laughs> that's great. That's great. Okay, so you, you guys have to let me know. Is this is this functioning properly? Uh, yeah, you were functioning properly just a second ago. Yeah. Right. Okay, good. good. All right. So um uh thanks for the, the introduction and um really glad that um I could be here with you guys this evening. Uh my name is Isa Mohammed. I am from the Twin Island Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. And I'm part of an organization called the Caribbean Institute of Astronomy. And we've been doing um, astronomy outreach uh, education um, for, um, how long is it now? About 17 years. Um, so I'm here to talk to you guys about electronically assisted astronomy, but let me start by showing you all my credentials. I am an imager and um, this is some of my work. Um, so I don't just do electronically assisted astronomy. As Alex was saying, there's sort of a distinction between the two and there sort of isn't a distinction between the two, but I do full proper um, imaging um, and I have one set up for doing that. Um, but also, as part of my work with Karina, we do a lot of outreach, and we've done a lot of outreach through the years, all through the Caribbean islands. So we do a lot of work in Trinidad, where we're based, but also Tobago, Barbados, Grenada, Guyana, Cayman Islands. Um, we've been up and down the, the islands um, sharing astronomy. And I know a lot of you guys have similar experiences doing astronomy outreach in your area. Um, it's, it was really out of this, um, desire to do outreach that we went into to the whole idea of, um, EAA in the first place. Our biggest event for the year is the Karina Star Party, which is in Trinidad. We have it once a year and it attracts about 500 odd people and it's the largest astronomy event, uh, on the island. So people look forward to it. Um, a lot of people really look forward to it. Um, but even stuff when we do a star party, a big component is always, always, always outreach. And it was for my purposes, for the purposes of doing outreach, um, that we started doing EAA um, probably about 10 years ago. 
So EAA, Electronically Assisted Astronomy, um, that's what they call it on cloudy nights. I, th I, I really believe that cloudy nights coined that term. I'm sure that it was, it was their forum naming policies that gave us this, this term. Um, people struggle to define it, so I'm not using anybody's definition here but my own. And this is what I think it is. And I call it a subset of the hobby of astronomy in which electronic devices are used to aid in the visual observation of astronomical objects. Um, basically, EAA is about observing and it's about using equipment to help you observe. And I think if there's, if there's a distinction between imaging and EAA, it's simply your intention. It's what are you trying to do? It's not about the, the, the tools and the technique, techniques so much as it is about the intention. When you, if you are doing imaging and you download a subframe, a single subframe, and you look at that subframe and you admire that subframe, in that instance, you are doing effectively EAA, which is you're looking at the thing as it's, as it's happening. And I think that's the, the, the heart of what it is. This started off as a way to enhance the experience of viewing through an eyepiece. That's what EAA started off as. Um, and I'm going to say that right now it's split into a few different areas. Um, there's video astronomy and then there's astronomy with these new CCD and CMOS cameras, and then there's night vision devices. And the first two items, they are sort of similar, but I consider them to be distinct, and, and you'll see why. What I'm going to go through with you guys today is those first two things, video astronomy and, uh, and where that led to, which is the, the EAA with the CCD and CMOS cameras today. And the night vision devices, that's a component of EAA, but it's really a separate thing. And it's distinct and should be treated as its own subject. And I'm not familiar with it um, at all. So I'm going to leave that for, for some other presentation for somebody else to do. So EAA started off as a way to enhance the view at the eyepiece. And a big motivation for, for wanting to enhance that view is things like light pollution, um, having to drive really far out um, away from the city to get a good view of objects. Um, but also um, things like some people have visual disabilities and it's very difficult for them to view through an eyepiece. So EAA, EAA started off as a way to enhance or replace the eyepiece on the telescope. Um, it has certain advantages beyond that. It allows you, a camera will allow you to get an image of a fainter object than your eye could see. Um, but a camera would also allow you to see color in that object. And looking through an eyepiece on a telescope, it's very rare that you see color on deep sky objects. Um, you know, that is, is actually, we found it to be important in our outreach and because color teaches you, or you could learn a lot about an object because of the color that it, it, it shows, the elements that uh, the object is comprised of. So the color thing is, is an important thing ap apart from just being an aesthetic thing. So you could see color, you could share the experience. And I think this is what really makes it great for, for outreach. Um, an eyepiece, looking through an eyepiece is really a personal experience. Uh, you don't, you never know what another person is actually seeing. Um, but with EAA, you get an image, you get an image on a screen and people could gather around that image and you could talk about it. You could have a conversation about it. You could point to the screen and actually show somebody this bit or that bit. And for an outreach, for an outreach uh, exercise, it really does add a lot, right? But also with regards to sharing, sharing doesn't necessarily stop there because sharing goes on to the internet and we could do things like, like broadcast star parties live. 
Um, and one more thing about EAA is that it's sort of a, a gateway into astronomical imaging because astronomical imaging is not a, it's not an easy thing to do. There are a lot of bits and pieces that have to work together to get a good astronomical image. So there's a high, a high barrier of entry, I would think. And EAA sort of, sort of bridges that gap. So this is, this is the sort of why people do EAA or why people would be interested in or would care about EAA today. Um, EAA started off really with webcams. Um, folks would, would remove the lens from in front of the webcam and attach a nose piece and, and attach it to their telescope. And with those, with those sort of devices, you could get an image of bright objects. You could get an image of the moon. You could get an image of Jupiter. But it was really limited uh, beyond those few bright objects. Because for astronomy, we, op we operate um, with very photon-starved conditions. In other words, the objects that we're looking at are very dim. They're very dim, and they're very difficult for our camera to pick up. The webcams that were modified for this purpose uh, weren't up to the challenge. Now, th they did release some commercial products based along these same types of sensors. They call them electronic eyepieces or things along those names. Uh, Mead, Orion, Celestron, they all had versions of them. Uh, but again, they, they worked on really bright objects and in a very narrow range of cases but they weren't really good at showing deep sky objects and certainly not, not good enough to pick up very faint galaxies, nebula, or do anything close to what we see um, with, with these beautiful color images that we get in the magazines and from the Hubble and that sort of thing. So those were very early days. The days those were very limited products, but somewhere around the turn of the century, um, a new line of products started becoming popular. And these would radically change what EAA could mean for astronomers because they were based around cameras that were really designed for low light conditions. Now, these, these sensors were developed for security cameras. And when you have security cameras operating at night, you need to be able to, to, to detect faint objects. So around the early 2000s, um, you got products coming on the market like the Marlin Cam and the Stella Cam and a couple others. Now, these, these were very different from the previous set of cameras that, that, that came out. They had a video output um, because these were effectively designed for the video camera industry. They had a, a video output, and, and that video signal would be your standard NTSC um, in the Americas or PAL across on, on the European side. And they were made to go to a TV, a, a CRT or a TV screen. Um, and so they were designed for low light conditions. So they had these big pixels. They had large pixels. Large pixels collect more photons than smaller pixels, so you always get more sensitivity. Um, they were very sensitive. And the chips were fairly small, a half inch to an inch. These small chips would allow you to use these cameras on telescopes that had very heavy focal reduction on them. So you would put on a, a 0.5 focal reducer, a 0.4 focal reducer, a 0.33 focal reducer. These are very aggressive focal reducers. They increase the optical speed of the system. They allow you to get that image onto the chip very, very quickly. These focal reducers create distortions in the image on the periphery of the field. But because the chips in these cameras were so small, they weren't really affected by the heavy focal reduction. So we had a combination of factors that came together here. You had optical tubes, telescopes, with focal reducers on them to build uh, photographic speed, coupled with these new cameras with small chips and big pixels 
putting out a video signal. Once the manufacturers figured out how to increase the exposure lengths on the individual frames, so you were no longer doing 15 frames a second or 30 frames a second, but you could do 10 second exposures, 30 second exposures, two minute exposures with these cameras. From the time they figured out how to do that, these things came together to make a system that worked really well for observing deep sky objects in real time. And the system worked so well that you didn't even necessarily need an equatorial mount, perfectly polar lined tracking the stars with an auto guider. But you could put this on a Dubsonian, you know, on the most basic types of telescope mounting systems. So long as you had any sort of tracking, altars or equatorial, because these systems were so sensitive, you're, you would be taking very short exposures and you could get away with it on almost any type of equipment. So this ushered in a capability that we hadn't seen before. This slide, I'm showing you two of my setups. Um, the one on the left is a simple refractor. It's an achromatic refractor. Um, when you're talking about astronomical imaging, achromatic refractors don't enter the discussion because they're considered to be optically inferior. But here I had an achromatic refractor, a very inexpensive telescope, and uh, it's the Orion 120 ST. It's a, it's a fast telescope at that, which is, is really frowned upon because the, 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 the optics are very, you, got, you have a lot of chromatic aberration in the optics. But hooked up to this uh, little Malincam camera, I could point it at the sky and get an image of an object. And if you guys are sharp eyed, you'd see the little star cluster shown on the TV on the floor behind it. And, and that's the butterfly cluster. Um, was it, is that Messier, is it seven? The butterfly cluster. To be able to do this at that point in time, this was in 2011, um, this was a game changer. On the image on the right, that's um, a telescope I have that's really more suited for imaging. That's a Maxut of Newtonian, an Intes Micro MN65. Um, and again, with the same camera and just a, a, a video cable between the camera and the TV screen, and there's an image of the Orion Nebula. This particular image was taken, was taken during an outreach event and for the first time, you could show people uh, the Orion Nebula in color, and you could point out features to them and explain things to them, and they could see something that's reminiscent of the pictures that they would see in the magazines or on the internet. We, anybody who's done outreach would know that showing deep sky objects, for some people, it's amazing, enlightening, and it opens their eyes. But for a lot of people, it's, it's, there's a certain amount of disappointment because you expect to see these bright, beautiful, colorful objects. But through an eyepiece, you don't see that. It looks like a, you know, it looks like a smudge a lot of the time. So this capability to show objects in real time in full color was really, really eye-opening. Now, remember, at this point in time, full-fledged astronomical imaging was, and still is to a large extent, a very complicated, tedious process. You can't show somebody um, while you are doing an, an astronomical image because you have frames being downloaded to your computer, and each of those frames is really meaningless to look at. It's only hours or sometimes days or sometimes weeks later all that data could be processed into a beautiful image. But you, you can't show somebody while you're doing it and expect them to, to see something interesting. This, to be able to throw up an image on your screen within a matter of minutes, um, really was a, a, a game changer. So here is a sample of the, the, the type of images that I would get off of that system. This was the, this is the, the Malincam Extreme. Um, 
it's a video camera because it outputs a video stream. And this signal goes onto a monitor and you look at it. So if you want to record what you're seeing, well, you could take a picture of the monitor and I just showed you a couple slides when we did that. But this was really meant for consumption at the point in time. This was not something that we were doing in order to show people afterwards because these images are very nice, but by the standards of astrophotography, they don't compare to what high quality systems produce. But when you are out in the open under the sky with a telescope and you point and this thing comes up, it's an amazing experience to be there as it's happening. And this is the crux of what EAA really was about. It's getting these images up on your screen while you are out under the stars with your telescope. It's a, it's, it's a very different experience to imaging. Now, when these cameras started becoming popular, it caused this sort of mini boom in interest in all analog video stuff. People were trying to find the best high resolution, old security video monitors on eBay and, and these devices that would take the analog video signal and, and make the increase the gamma or decrease the black levels and all sorts of things to get the images to look better. And I could tell you something, that there was a certain magic about seeing these images on, on those old CRT displays because they have a quality to them. They have a charm to them that the LCD um, computer screens that we have today doesn't quite replicate. It, it, it really was a, a, a beautiful thing to see presented on those screens, even with all the, the little blemishes in the images. But just to get these images at all in color on your screen within seconds was a huge deal. The image on the bottom right, that's the Dumbbell Nebula. That one in particular, always I find it useful and I find it enlightening to show people that there's green on the inside and there's red on the outside. And that signifies the elements that that, that object is made of, uh, oxygen, hydrogen. And it speaks to the processes that created that star and eventually led to its demise. So. It really was a, 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 a lovely, a lovely advancement to have this capability. So while this stuff could be done completely without a computer, because the video signal from the camera goes straight into the monitor, um, of course, adding a computer into the mix allowed for improvements. So pretty soon, um, software developers were creating programs that would allow you to enhance this experience. So you had software now to control the intricacies of the cameras because the cameras had many parameters on them, the gain, um, the color balance, the exposures. There were a lot of intricacies that needed to be adjusted on these cameras themselves. So on the one hand, the software could help you control the camera itself. And on the other hand, the software could help you capture and enhance the image that you were getting. Now, these cameras were outputting video signals. So to get it into your computer, you needed a frame grabber, a USB dongle that would accept a video signal and bring it into your computer. And once the video was coming into your computer, these programs would capture that video and then you would start doing things with it. So this um, image here is the, 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 the Malincam control uh, software. Uh, developed by Milo Slick, and it was really popular with these with these Malincam video cameras, and it allowed you to greatly increase your capability. Um, these cameras suffered a lot from amp glow, and there were ways to to curb the amp glow. And there were other little things you could try to subtract a dark frame to help deal with hot pixels. Uh, it never worked a hundred percent, but it, it sure did improve things. So here's, here's video astronomy versus traditional astrophotography. 
And these are these are two of my images. Uh, the one on the right, of course, um, captured using traditional astrophotography techniques. The one on the left taken again with the with the Malin camera. And I considered both of these to be phenomenal and for totally different reasons. And it really strikes to the heart of the difference between the two approaches. Because the one on the left um, was done sitting under the sky with my telescope next to me. And I was able to view the horse head nebula. Um, something that um, in visual astronomy, I have yet to do. I understand you need a hydrogen beta filter to make it easier to see. But it's a challenging object to view visually. It's a very, very challenging object. Yet with my little 120 ST refractor hooked up to this little video cam, I'm able to, to see and view the Horsehead Nebula. The one on the right, um, as a contrast, it's a, a beautiful image, yes, but it took literally a couple of weeks to, to, to create that image. And the process of doing it wasn't anything near as, as, as relaxing um, and as soothing as sitting under the sky with my telescope looking at the image. So while both EAA and imaging involve, you know, capturing photons on these cameras to make images, the difference is really in what are you doing? What is your intention? What is your purpose behind gathering those, phot those photons? If you're gathering them to look at right now with the telescope, probably by yourself or with a group of people, that's EAA. And if you're gathering them with the intention of refining them and processing them and creating a beautiful uh, image as good as you could make it to show people afterwards, then that's, then that's imaging. It's about when you consume the image, so to speak. Um, okay, so now we come to, to, to the next big revolution in, thing, in terms of EAA and, and how it progressed. So we got to the point where there were these software packages being developed for these video cameras that were helping with the processing and presentation of their images. Well, there was one particular feature in these software packages that really stood out. And that feature was live stacking. So with the Marlin cams, with these video cameras, typically what you would do is you would take individual exposures. So most of those images I would have shown you would have been individual exposure, one minute exposure. Um, if, you, if, you, if you use a light pollution filter, you could probably go to a two minute exposure. Um, but live stacking allowed you to combine multiple exposures into one better image. And this radically started to change things. See, um, when you start combining these images, the signal to noise ratio of your image dramatically, dramatically increases, right? For the folks who are accustomed doing imaging, this is not new, this is normal, this is our bread and butter, this is what we do all the time. You take a lot of sub-exposures and you combine them together, you average them into one exposure that has a much higher signal-to-noise ratio than the individual sub-exposures. With EAA, software started coming on stream that would do this on the fly as you were imaging. So for traditional astrophotography, you capture all your images, you save them into a folder, and then the next day or whenever you get a chance, you run those images through a software that will, stack, will, will combine them and stack them together. The EAA applications, on the other hand, what they would do is they would combine these images one by one together as they were coming in. And they would use the stars in the image to line these images up one on top of the other perfectly. So this had, this had one huge effect on the industry in that now 
almost any camera could be used to do EAA because you didn't need the most super um, sensitive to get as much signal as you can in one minute um, before your tracking starts going haywire. Now, you could take hundreds of five second or 10 second exposures from any camera and combine them into a beautiful image. And that's what the software that was coming on stream was geared towards doing. So this is an example. Uh, this is not my image. I got this off the internet. I hope nobody minds. Um, this is an example of how an image increases as you combine multiple smaller exposures. These are all two minute exposures. And you can see on the top left, that's one. Uh, then on the top right, that's two. Then there's four exposures, eight exposures, 16, 32. By the time you get to 56 exposures, which is the, the one at the bottom, and then you compare it to the first one, you could see there's a dramatic difference in terms of what's possible. So you could have a, a, a camera that's not that sensitive. Um, it's not these super sensitive video cameras, but you could have a camera that once you could get enough stars in the image for the software to use to align with, you could start combining your exposures and you could create a really nice image. They went further, um, these software packages. Um, so in addition to stacking in real time, now they also included the capability to do dark frame subtraction, to do flat frames, and to apply all of these things in real time as the image is coming in. This is an example of, of, of the difference um, in capability. On the left, we have the old um, analog style video cameras, that's the Marlin cam. And you could see that there's amp glow in the top left hand corner. You could see there's vignetting because the edges are darker. You could see there's dust motes, these little round donuts um, um, on top of the image. On the right hand side, you could see an image that again is EAA because it was acquired live um, next to the telescope, but it's flat, the amp glow is gone, um, the dust motes are not there, and the stars are a lot cleaner and sharper. The reason why the stars are a lot cleaner and sharper is because this camera has much smaller pixels. The much smaller pixels means that it's not, each pixel is not gobbling as much photons as the pixels on the other video camera. It's not as capable in low light conditions as the video camera. But because we could stack multiple images together, we could make up for that loss in sensitivity by carrying on the integration for a longer period of time. And it allows us to create what is arguably a superior image using um, a camera that is not quite as sensitive. Now, the, the other big advantage here is that there were a whole bunch of new cameras coming onto the marketplace that were really suitable for this sort of application. These new CMOS cameras um, out of China for, from companies like Zoo, ZWO, QHY, these cameras, um, they had low read noise. Um, they were sensitive enough. They had fast download rates. And we could get them to work with the EAA software um, uh, pretty, pretty well. Okay, so this is an example of the type of rig that does this sort of work. Now, I, I showed you previously um, my setup with the analog video camera. Well, this is um, the same setup, the same mount, the same telescope, but using the ASI 385 camera. And Apart from being able to, to, to make a better image, what's really appealing about this is that the camera is a USB camera. It plugs directly into your computer and the image goes straight in. With the video cameras, you always had a whole mess of cables um, around the system getting that to work because you had to, to send a control cable to the camera. You had to have power to the camera. You had to have the video coming out. And then you had to have a USB frame grabber. And all those things had to be powered. 
Um, with these new USB cameras, you put the camera in the eyepiece, you get one USB cable coming across. If it's a, a, a tech-cooled camera, you might have to connect a power cable as well. So that's just two, but that's, that's pretty much it. And it was a much simpler, simpler system to use. And while being simpler, you could arguably get superior results. And also, the cameras were a lot less expensive. So it's software that made that possible. Uh, software was the key to getting, getting this system to work um, with, these, with these cameras. So, so long as we have the, the software that allows it to work, we now have a lot of capability with these inexpensive um, cameras to do even better imaging. Right. So for those of you who are interested, the telescope here, I mean, it's on the slide. It's an Intes Micro MN65. The mount is the Orion Sirius EQG. The camera is the ZWO ASI 385MC Pro. The software package that I'm running this with here is the Sky X. Um, because the Sky X now has the capability to do live stacking. And I believe that was demoed on this very channel some, some while ago. Um, I also used here a focal reducer and a light pollution filter because I'm shooting from my home and the skies are pretty bad, magnitude 18.44 or thereabouts. Um, but even under those conditions, good results can be had. Okay, so the EAA software is the key to getting this thing to work. And I'm going to say upfront, point blank, that the most popular and widely used software for EAA right now in the hobby is SharpCap. Um, SharpCap was a bit of a game changer. It was one of the first uh, software to support pretty much a wide range of cameras while also bringing the capabilities we need for EAA, the live stacking, the dark subtraction, uh, and, and, and the flats. So SharpCap is very popular. Um, it's, it's, it's very widely used and it's go-to. I don't use SharpCap because I run my system off an Apple computer and SharpCap only runs on Windows. So um, SharpCap is probably the number one choice out there for the astronomy software, but it's not for everybody and um, I can't use it. So there are other options. Um, the Sky X, it has capabilities recently added that allows it to do EAA, the live stacking, the dark subtraction, the full works. Um, it is not as tweakable as SharpCap, in my opinion. You don't have as many levers to pull. Um, so, so I would say SharpCap has, has some features that it doesn't have. However, it is quite capable and it, it, it does work pretty well. Um, um, it works It works pretty well. So it's a good option. Um, it will run cross-platform. So if you're on Linux, if you're on Apple, uh, it'll run on a Raspberry Pi. So that's, that's, that's pretty good. Um, it is not free. It is not cheap. So there's a disadvantage. Um, Z ZWO has their own suite of software as well called ASI Studio. And there is a component in there called ASI Live. And that does work cross-platform as well. And it is, it again, it works. Um, it's very similar to the story with SharpCap. It does not have as much levers to pull and buttons to press as SharpCap does. But it does have the basics, uh, the live stacking, the darks, the flats, um, and it works. Uh, Starlight Express has had a software package out for a long, long time now called Starlight Live. And this was around... Um, uh, for quite a while now, it's a, it's a well-regarded solution, but again, it only works with, with their cameras. Um, and there's one that um, I should have on this list, and it isn't, and that's the, the Malincam um, uh, software. They also have um, new USB cameras and um, the uh, required Malincam Sky EAA software to drive them, and that, that really should be on this list as well. But again, the same situation with ZWO and Starlight Life, it only works with their cameras. So that's that's a bit of a, a disadvantage. 
um, because my particular camera is a is a ZWO camera, I tend to use both uh, the ASI Live software from ZWO and the Sky X because I happen to have that um, from uh, my regular astrophotography uh, setup. So I did not purchase the Sky X just for EA. All right, this is an example of SharpCap. Um, this is not my system. Um, this is a screenshot from my colleague Amrit Sicharan, um, who does EAA with SharpCap. Uh, the image there, I believe, is Messier 83, the Southern Pinwheel Galaxy. And you can see what the screen looks like. Um, of particular interest is the histogram to the bottom. So you would set up the software to stack the images. You would set it up to subtract the darks to, to, to divide the flats. Um, it'll start live stacking, but when the stack, as the stack is building, you would be adjusting these histogram controls on the bottom of the screen to tune your image to get it to look better. You'd be adjusting the black levels, you'd be adjusting the mid-tones. Very similar to what you do during processing an astronomical image after you've, um, after you've calibrated it and, and stacked it. So the difference here is that you're constantly making tweaks throughout the, the observing session um, as you are looking at the image on the screen. And as the stack builds, the image changes um, over time. So you're constantly changing and adjusting to get the best image possible on the screen, right? That's uh, part and parcel of the process there, right? Okay, so that's an idea of, I guess, the history of, of, of EAA. Um, how it started with little webcams and the little electronic eyepieces. The, the big change with the introduction of the video astronomy cameras. By the way, back then, it was really called video astronomy. Uh, the term EAA, or electronically assisted astronomy, hadn't come up yet. So back then, it was video astronomy, uh, mainly because the cameras used to do it uh, were video cameras. They gave out a video signal. And then the transition to the, 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 the software-driven uh, um, uh, uh, era of EAA, where really it's the, it's the software that's the heart of the operation. And um, that's, that's, that's where we are now. So that's the sort of, of progression um, over the past uh, 15 years or so, right? So a lot of people would want to know um, obviously, well, what, so, how, what is the sort of gear that they need to get into this? And I'm going to go through gear over the next few slides, right? So EAA camera options. What sort of cameras are being used right now for this and what could be recommended? I don't really want to recommend specific cameras because right now we are going through a time where a lot of new cameras are coming onto the market very, very quickly. And so it's difficult to make a recommendation um, even based on experience because the best camera that's probably available right now is probably one that I would not have had experience with. So rather than that, I'm going to say these are the sort of things that you want to look for and why. Um, for EAA camera options, you tend to want the smaller chips rather than the bigger chips. Um, this is different from regular astronomy imaging because a big chip is desirable, it gives you a bigger field of view. But for EAA, even though you could integrate for long periods of time, you still want to get your image up on screen quickly. You want that live experience. So you want fast optics. You want aggressive focal reduction. You want fast um, optics. And unless you're willing to pay a lot, um, fast optics come with optical aberrations. And the small chips are much more forgiving of those optical aberrations than the large chips. But apart from that, there's another reason to favor smaller chips. And that is the live stacking, um, which is happening as the frames are being downloaded from the camera. This puts a toll on your computer in terms of processing capability. And if you are downloading massive, I don't know, 50 megapixel frames, your computer is going to struggle with stacking those frames on the fly. So for those two reasons, you're probably better off with a, a smaller size chip. 
Having said that, nothing is wrong with a, a larger chip. If your optics could handle it, if your computer could handle it, and you're happy with the results that you're getting, then it's fine. Generally, EAA favors the smaller chips. Uh, EAA favors large pixels, again, for a couple reasons. Um, they are less sensitive to the distortions as well. You don't have to care about your spot sizes of your stars because of your focal reducers if your pixels are huge. Um, those aberrations would not show up on big pixels. But big pixels also gather light faster, so they're more, they're more sensitive. And that allows you to keep your sub-exposure times small. Again, this is a recurring theme. That means that your tracking does not have to be so perfect and your optics do not have to be so perfect. So most of the times with EAA, you get by without having to auto-guide. Nothing wrong with auto-guiding. And if you're comfortable auto-guiding, having um, good tracking and good optics, and you don't have a problem investing the time that is required to get images with smaller pixels, then yes, smaller pixels will work as well. But generally, the community favors the slightly larger pixels for those reasons. Um, monochrome versus color. Monochrome is more sensitive. You could get an image up faster. Um, but the color cameras lend to the experience um, of EAA quite well. A lot of people do prefer to do EAA with monochrome cameras, and the monochrome cameras do fit with the theme of getting the image up as fast as possible. Um, having said that, I think a big part of the experience is seeing the images in color. Remember, one of the, the advantages or one of the motivations for doing EAA is so that you could see something that is beyond what you can see in the eyepiece. The view in the eyepiece is dim, the view in the eyepiece is monochromatic, the view in the eyepiece is not detailed. But stick a camera there instead, and now you have a bright image that is colorful and detailed. So personal opinion, personal preference, um, but I prefer, prefer color cameras for EAA. Um, going into the specifics of the camera, of course you want something with high QE, meaning that's the, 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 the quantum efficiency. That's how well the camera converts um, actual photons coming in to, to, to counts, uh, to the, the, the counts on the image, to the, to the image. Because these cameras, they don't perfectly convert every photon of light they receive. Um, uh, not every photon gets counted in your image. Uh, there's a certain percentage that gets detected and there's a certain percentage that does not get detected. You want a high QE as possible to detect as much light as possible. You want low read noise. It would allow you to keep your sub-exposures -exposure, shorter. You want fast frame downloads because with a large number of short exposures, if your, if your frames took a long time to download, you are incurring significant image overhead. Uh, in other words, you'd be spending as much time downloading frames as you would be actually collecting photons. So you want people to download frames quickly. Um, tech cooling is a plus. It is not absolutely necessary, but for the same reasons in imaging, if you have a cooled camera, there's less thermal noise, there are less hot pixels, and um, dark subtraction would work better when you have a cooled camera. So. Uh, it's not absolutely necessary. Uh, lots of people do EAA without the cooled camera, but I recommend it if you could afford it. So to specific camera recommendations, like I said before, I don't really want to do, but I will say that right now, probably what I use is a IMX 385 based sensor, which is the ZWO ASI 385. It works pretty well. There's a new camera, a new sensor on the market, and there are new cameras built around that sensor. That's the IMX 533, which also seems like a good option for EAA. The IMX 294 is a bigger chip, but it's also quite popular. Um, these are sort of go-to answers for this question, but I must stress very strongly that almost any camera 
uh, can work even a, a DSLR. Um, it's a matter of can it come to focus on your telescope? Can you get the image into one of these software packages um, with enough fidelity for those software packages to detect stars and start stacking your image? Once you satisfy that criteria, pretty much any camera should work. Telescopes, what kind of telescope um, would you need? Um, any telescope that could focus on your camera. And I am serious about that. I have done EAA just recently with a 50 millimeter guide scope hooked up to my 385 camera. And the 50 millimeter guide scope wasn't even on a tracking mount. It was on a manual Altaz, a William Optics, uh, a William uh, Easy Touch, uh, the Easy Touch mount. It's a manual mount. Um, almost any telescope could work, right? But if you're really interested in EAA and you want to know what's most suitable, you want fast focal ratios. Um, the ideal telescopes are considered to be the, the big SCTs with hyperstars, so you're down to F2, or the RASA scopes. These are Celestron uh, telescopes, F2, F3, thereabouts. These are considered really ideal uh, for EAA. Um, you would have to look at what focal length you want. Um, this would really depend on the type of targets that you're going after, as it is with regular imaging. With small galaxies, you would want longer focal lengths, but understand the tracking requirements are also steeper. Um, with shorter focal lengths, you would tend to go after um, larger nebulae and that sort of thing. Th to me, there's a nice all-around focal length somewhere around 600 millimeters, you know, five, six, seven, 800 millimeters thereabouts that you could tend to, to do sort of a large number of objects with. So if I had to recommend a type of focal length, it would probably be around that area, six, seven, 800 millimeters. It's, it's a good all round that would allow you to see a, a large variety of objects. Um, one thing that you do not need on your telescope, you do not need uh, the, the really nice apochromatic glass. Um, you do not need pinpoint correction across a large field. Um, so you don't need the very expensive imaging telescopes. Those things don't hurt. They would be nice to have, and they would probably make your image better. But for this sort of EA thing, that is not necessary you could get by um you could get by on a on a orion star blast dobsonian um which are these telescopes that are really made for kids and they're small and they're dobsonians and they're fast f4 optics on a newtonian they're considered terrible for regular imaging but they work fine for eaa um because they have fast optics and because most likely you're going to be using a small chip and you're going to be using big pixels. So it's very forgiving of these, of these sorts of telescopes. Right. Um, the mounts, ideally, an equatorial tracking mount is, is, is perfect. But an alt-as tracking mount can work as well. Because software is now the heart of EAA. And the software, with its live stacking, it could auto-rotate the images. So... With an alt-as tracking mount, the problem you get is field rotation. But these stacking algorithms, they could rotate to compensate for the field rotation. So long as your exposures are short enough that the stars don't trail, then by all means, use an alt as mount, mount. And again, beginning to sound like a stock record, but if we're using big pixels, um, small chip cameras, and, and short exposures, these things become a non-issue. So you could use a go-to Dubsonian. You could use a fork-mounted um, SCT. And as the technology is getting better, it's really getting to the point where you wouldn't even need tracking at all. And I'm, I'm not saying that we're quite there yet. But I did have a lovely experience doing EAA with a 50 millimeter guide scope on a manual Aldaz mount. Uh, caveat, I was under fairly dark skies. So under dark skies, you could get away with sh much shorter exposures. I was using one second exposures and I was not stacking. I was using one second exposures and not stacking. 
and I was seeing the Omega Nebula, the Lagoon Nebula, the Triffid Nebula, um, all the showpieces on the Summer Milky Way, and it was a lovely experience. Um, and it was very, very, very real time. So we're really getting to the point where, where you won't need to. But ideally, an equatorial tracking mount is what I would recommend, if at all possible. And go to really does add another layer of capability because it allows you to sit back on your computer, point an object, and your telescope will go to that object and bring it up for you to see. And it's, it's, it's really, really is a wonderful time to be doing astronomy, to have all these, these features um, available. Okay. Um, options on accessories is, is um, a whole long talk by itself. I mentioned focal reducers. There are a lot of them on the market. Um, so long as your, your optical train, everything works with each other, your camera, its nose piece, the focal reducer, and your telescope focuser, so long as they all work together, then it, it ought to be fine. The, the, the more well-corrected focal reducers will be better, but again, we're using small chips usually, so you could get away with cheap focal reducers. Those super cheap 0.5x focal reducers, for EAA, they work, right? Light pollution filters, there, there are a number of options here. Um, this tends to work much better for emission nebulae rather than galaxies, right? Um, what I would say is that if you're using a light pollution filter, it'd be really nice if you have one that allows infrared to pass through. Um, that actually helps with galaxies, but most of the light pollution filters don't do that. Um, I use the astronomic UHC light pollution filter for my nebulae, and that, that does allow IR to pass through and it works pretty pretty well. But there are a lot, the IDAS LPS set of filters were well considered. The Orion Skyglow um, filter is well considered. Um, Astronomic Bada Planetarium, they all make good options. The very, very narrow bandpass filters, um, I've not used those for EAA. Right, they do work well for regular photography. I have not used them for EAA, but I will say in theory, so long as enough stars show up in your image for the software to stack with, then in theory, even those narrow bandpass filters should work. Right. Uh, the other optional accessory you might want to consider is an auto guider. Um, for a lot of people, you know, you tend to prefer the simplicity of not having an auto guider. But if you are comfortable setting up and using an auto guider, it's always better to have one than to not have one. Um, especially if you're using, um, if you're not using one of the premium telescope mounts, if you're not using an astrophysics or software bisque mount, um, things happen and an image could shift and it could ruin your stack. And if you are auto guiding um, and you are interested in stacking for like half an hour or 45 minutes or something really long like that, then the auto guider could help keep things on track during those long, during those longer stacking stacks. So the auto guider is, is a not necessary, but is a good option to have. Yeah. All right. Um, so this is, this is, a another example of a setup for astrophotography. It's my Orion 120 ST. Um, on the back of it is a manual filter wheel, and I use that manual filter wheel to switch between my light pollution filters, my various light pollution filters, and no filter, because not every filter is suitable for every object, so it's nice to have the ability to flip. Um, I have a flip camera there with an eyepiece, and that's what I use to do my star alignments, because you still have to align your telescope as you normally would. And then that's the camera sticking out the back, and that's pretty much it. Uh, you focus manually. Um, Batinov masks are very useful here if you don't have an auto focuser to dial your focus in. You could use a Batinov mask and that works uh, pretty well. And this setup connected to the SkyX or the ZWO ASI Live software uh, is, pretty, is pretty capable, right? Um, here's uh, another uh, setup and um, one of my three boys is sitting down next to it enjoying himself. Um, what I want you to notice about this is that the camera is not hooked up to the telescope, it's hooked up to the guide scope. 
And this is the configuration I was talking about with the, the, the telescope just hooked up to a guide scope on an alt azimuth mount. And this was surprisingly fun uh, to use. And this is about as simple as EAA gets. And yes, you could get a full color image of bright nebulae just from that setup. And it really goes to show how much these new cameras and the new, the new software um, has brought uh, capability um, where, you know, just a few years ago, you wouldn't dream that a guide scope would be usable for this sort of thing, yeah, but it is. So that's, that's my bit about um, uh, the gear side of it. But really what drives me is what you can do with it. And I just want to go through a couple stories I have. Um, this was back in 2012. There was an event. There was a transit of Venus. Uh, Venus was passing in front of the disk of the sun. And um, it was a really big deal. It's a very rare event. It doesn't happen very often at all. It was a once in a lifetime experience. And um, my work with the Caribbean Institute of Astronomy. So from Trinidad, where I am based, we could not see this event. Um, but it was visible from the Cayman Islands. Um, this was back in 2012 when things weren't quite as connected as they are now. Uh, what we did um, flew over to the Cayman Islands and set up the Malin Cam on a, a, a solar telescope. That's a Coronado, a Mead Coronado solar telescope. And we were actually able to um, transmit this event live back to back to Trinidad. And in fact, it was it was live on on the internet for anybody to see it. This was back in 2012. This was before live streaming was was as as ubiquitous as it is as it is today. And for back then we considered it to be a really a really wonderful accomplishment um, to get and this was carried live on television um, on air in Trinidad as it was happening. Um, so it was uh, it's a nice example of what EAA allows to happen. It sort of breaks the rules um, of, of traditional astronomy. Here's another event. This was a partial solar eclipse in 2013 um, in, in Trinidad. And we did a, a outreach event where we gathered um, on the, the rooftop of a building on, um, at the University of the West Indies. And again, the whole thing was, was carried live and broadcast um, using the Marlin Cam on a solar telescope. Um, these are daylight examples, but we have night examples as well. So this was another event. This was a, a, a lunar eclipse that was in 2015. And we did a big astronomy outreach on the university campus. And if you could see this picture, we set up a big screen with a projector. And we projected the, the entire eclipse was was from beginning to end, um, was projected on that screen um, with everybody um, sitting and relaxing on the grassy field in front of it, sort of like a, an, an astronomy drive-in theater, right? Um, so this was a, a pretty interesting application and as well. And again, showing how in a social setting, in an outreach setting, um, uh, this is really, really, really powerful. In this case, projecting it up on the screen. Um, these, this is a whole slew of images taken during Karina Star Party 2016, right? So we had our annual Star Party, and apart from folks lining up to look through the eyepiece, um, I had my, my Malincam set up. This was done with the Malincam with the video astronomy gear. And um, folks were able to, to stop by and see astronomical objects in a way that they hadn't been able to see it before. And you could see the variety of objects we have here. We have planetary nebulae, we have galaxies, um, we have globular clusters, we have emission nebulae, um, a broad range of, of objects and a broad range of topics um, could be discussed um, using this, 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 this sort of setup. Now this year was actually interesting with the, um, the, the coronavirus because all of our outreach activities had to come to a complete halt and what we did instead was we turned to online events. So we had online um, star parties. And this one in particular I'm showing you is, um, so, so during, during the bright phases of the moon, what do astronomers do? We don't like the moon. 
Well, in this case, um, we took everybody on a tour of the moon and we were able to point out all the craters and all the, 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 the sea of tranquility and sea of serenity and where the Apollo mission landed. And, you know, one interesting thing about this type of outreach, um, in a previous slide, I don't know if you guys noticed, but there was a, a, a game pad controller sitting on the table next to it. When you have something like this running, you could have your participants pick up a game pad and actually control the telescope and move around the moon. It's like it's like your own virtual moon rover. You could drive on the surface of the moon using your game pad and pan around and the people attending your outreach could control this themselves and kids love it. So, you know, it's 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 really again capability. It's really really good to have this sort of capability. The last, the, the most ambitious project that we undertook was an all-night Messier marathon. And this was using the newer ZWO cameras. And it wasn't just me, myself, and, and my colleague who does EAA. I showed you a picture from his setup before. He uses a C9.25 SCT and an ASI-224 camera. And we both got together um, on a live stream and we went through the entire Messier catalog and we logged 100 objects um, in one night. And this here is an example of the images we, we, we pulled off. And um, it was, it, it really speaks to the, the, the capability that exists today, where we could slew from object to object to object. And with uh, the Sky X and the pointing models and the T point and all of those things working well, plate solving, you could literally view a hundred objects in detail, in color, in one night. And um, it, it was really gratifying for me to be able to do that. So a lot of this is about what you, the, the, the EAA software gives you capability and it's up to the astronomers now to figure out how can we use this capability for our personal observations, but also in terms of how we, we, we reach out to the public. I'm gonna leave you, leave you with this final image here. Um, this is not my setup, this is my friends. This is the Whirlpool uh, Nebula Messier 51, but this is an EAA image. This is not astrophotography. And the point I want to make here is that the images that are being produced right now via the EAA process are of a very, very, very high standard. Um, very, very high standard. So those lines between EAA and astrophotography, you know, they're probably always going to be blurred. But this is, uh, to me, an example of what is achievable with the current tools and techniques of EAA and this image probably honestly this was a longer a longer integration probably 45 minutes to an hour thereabouts um, of, of integration but it's a, a lovely image and a lovely demonstration of what EAA can do so that brings me to the end of what I have prepared for you guys today I guess from here um, it's questions well I can tell you that uh, there are We've been following the stream over there, and there have been many comments about um, it's a, you did a pretty good job telling us about EAA. That a lot of people like this presentation, and I can tell you from the metrics that um, uh, you, you kept a bigger crowd here for you know you kept them throughout the show about seventy some people. That's pretty good for us. So uh, really appreciate it. There was one question, and about oh, thirty seconds after it was asked. Uh, who was that back there? Um, he asked us about, he asked whether it would, uh, the cooling helps at all. Who was that, Anak that asked that? And then about 30 seconds later, Anak says, hey, look, my question's answered. So yeah, <laughs> just the right time. Did you want to say anything more about that for Anak uh, as far as the cooling goes? As far as the cooling goes, I mean, I guess, as I said, it's it's nice to have. It's not absolutely necessary. But this particular image that I have up here right now, this Whirlpool Galaxy that my friend did, his camera does not have cooling on it. He has the 220 ASI 224 without cooling. And this is the sort of image that, that he was able to produce. I know a lot of it goes down to the personal experiences of the, of the astronomer. 
Um, but at least this is a, a, a demonstration that it can be done without cooling. Me personally, I prefer to have the cooling. Um, mm -hmm. I, think, I think it helps. But if you have a camera without it, by all means, try. Okay, Isa, you might want to stop presenting and that way we can see your face full screen. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, that's it. Um, and then um, I think one of the things that I really got out of your presentation was that it's important to realize that you're not after the same thing. You're not after the same idea. It's when you read through cloudy nights or when you watch you know, people on the Astro Imaging Channel saying how you have to be this precise on this and that precise on that. Yeah, you do. If you're going to be pixel peeping, <laughs> if you're going to be putting it up on the big screen, if you're going to be doing all that other stuff and printing it out at 300, 600 dots per inch on a 17 inch wide piece of paper. Yeah, you better. But if what you want to do is wow some people with, hey, look what I got. Look, that's right up there right now. And see, you can use this joystick and move it around and find the little craters on the moon. And, and then it's a whole different story. And, uh, yeah. and I think that that's one of the things I want to say. I follow the discussions on the forums, and it always upsets me when people try to, to say, well, OK, for EAA, you have to expose for less than five minutes or something like that. Or, you know, um, if you use flats or darks, then it's no longer EAA, it's now astrophotography. And to me, trying to define it in that way is a great disservice. Um, to me, the what is EAA? It's about what you are trying to do and what you are trying to accomplish. It's not about whether you expose for two minutes or 10 minutes or an hour. It's about whether you are observing or whether it's where you are consuming your stuff. Either you're doing it with the telescope or you're doing it next week. And that's what it is. It has nothing to do with the arbitrary five minutes or 10 minutes. Yeah. Uh, did I get muted just now? Let me see. Um, I think, no, I'm still on. Okay. Um, no, you're, you're still on. Yeah. Um, the, uh, uh, I'm watching two different feeds here, so I get a little confused as to what's exactly is happening. The, the source of some of that confusion about that it can only be this long and you can't process it and stuff like that is, I think, cloudy nights, which an awful lot of us <laughs> go to and we should. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cloudy nights has a definition at the top of their EAA and night vision forum that says no processing is allowed in EAA. That's not what they mean to say. What they mean to say is that no processing is allowed in this forum. If you're going to be processing the images, take them over to the CCD, CMOS, and beginning and in, in intermediate astroimaging form, because that's going to that's a whole different kind, a whole different level. The point behind EAA is visual observing at the telescope right here and now with a telescope and a camera. Yes. Yeah, and that's yes. the only difference. Every if you're saying that, oh no, there is a rule as to what's EAA and what isn't EAA. Uh, -uh. Yep. uh I, I okay. Um, I, I want everybody who's got any questions to to bring in your questions, and I want to go back to a couple of things that are on the main page here. I don't know if I can. Let me see if I can share my screen here. Presenters view, present view, and uh, share my entire screen and point share and now you should see where am i going oh there we go oh you're seeing me um there's a couple of things that you gotta you gotta see on our website here i didn't point this out earlier but i think most of you guys have been here before uh there's all sorts of comments here and these comments will be hanging around for quite some time so that, uh, when you pull up your youtube stream later you'll be able to see these questions and comments uh, there's also a place here to donate if you'd like to donate to us that'd be great but you know we're not in we're not a business we're a nonprofit. I want you to notice something over here, though, something I, I come back and talk to you about all on a regular basis, 9.01. We have broken the 9,000 mark, and remember, my goal is to get to 1,000. Yeah, we like lights. 10, 10. 10,000, sorry. Yeah, so um, my conscience struck. Uh, thanks, Toga. Um, 
Uh, so I was real happy this morning when I turned it on and I found out that we were at 9,000, so that we're doing good. So hit that old button over there that says to subscribe. I don't have one of those buttons because like they assume that the guy who owns the list, I guess, has subscribed already. Um, but uh, subscribe if you, if you like the show. Uh, certainly put some likes in. If you've got any questions, though, and you put some comments in here, down, down over here, these comments, if you want to ask Issa some questions, uh, more specific as to his presentation, I got to tell you, we don't usually read those comments down there. They might get answered, but they might not. The best way to do it is to go back to the contact here. And, uh, you you know, this is, this, you tell us your names and stuff like that, and we will forward the question on to Isa, and he can get back to you and stuff like that. Okay, so that's the best way to do it at the astroimagingchannel.org, and we'll try to get back to you to get your answer. Also, somebody out there was asking us, um, uh, you know, how we put this together. Well, I'm not exactly sure with the blooper reels that we sometimes have here. Uh, who was that that was asking, Tim, or was it? Um... Anyway, my point is, um, you'll send us a message there, and we can tell you what we do know about um, uh about how to live stream and all this other stuff. It's been changing and it will probably change some more as time goes on. Um, but at any rate, is there any, unless there's more questions, I don't I don't think I see any. Um, don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to come back next week because I think it's, it's Manny next week, right? Let me check that. Hey, it's right here on calendar, like I said, and uh, July 5th. Yeah, Manny's going to be here. He's going to tell us about an observatory he's been building and it's it's done. As a matter of fact, I was watching pictures of it the other day. Um, so uh, pictures from it. He was doing EAA from it during our outreach the other day. No, he wasn't. It rained on him that day. But the practice outreach before that. Okay, I got to keep it straight here. Um, Manny will be showing us about how to build an observatory. You know, there's a lot of questions, decisions you got to make about what to do, how big to do, and all this other stuff. Manny's been through it. Come on over and we'll, we'll ask him some questions and see what he's got to say about it. Okay, where are we? Um, I'm going to stop sharing. And I want to thank Isa for being here. Thank you for volunteering. Remember, guys, we need you to volunteer to make this show something worthwhile. Okay, so please volunteer. Okay. Uh, Let me just make a suggestion. We might want to do this later on. If the presenter puts a comment on the bottom of this video under his own name and people reply to that comment as questions, the presenter will get a notification on their YouTube account saying that somebody replied to your comment. Okay. Good point. Thank you. I, I have just noticed a couple of times that I pulled up the comment section and I said, hey, we never really answer these comments, do we? So, okay. So subscribe. Donate if you like, but most importantly, see y'all next week. And now, if I can get Molly to take us out. All right, I will do that right now. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> okay. I don't know what day it is, wherever Terry is, but he says it's his birthday. <laughs> so happy birthday, Terry, one of the crew that's regularly here helping us to run this thing. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday, Terry. Okay, now you can take us out. All right.